Hey, I'm Anfa. I'm an electronic music producer and sound designer, though I only use open source software and Linux for all my work. In this video, I want to talk about loudness and dynamic range. I was thinking about discussing this topic for quite a while, and I thought I'm going to do it in this beautiful place, listening to the sounds of nature. All right, so what is dynamic range? In the broadest understanding, it's the difference between the smallest and the largest amount of something that you can register. For example, in a camera, a dynamic range would be the smallest amount of light versus the largest amount of light that the camera can register. In a microphone, it's the quietest sound versus the loudest sound that the microphone can capture. And then let's add without distortion because, well, absolutely any microphone can capture a nuclear explosion from five meters away, I would say, but none of them can do it without distortion. So for the level of input to count, it, he it has to be clean. It has to be reproduced with great fidelity. Of course, there are some limits and some thresholds we could apply, like how much distortion is acceptable, etc. Because nothing is perfect and nothing is actually linear in the analog domain. And this very much happens in the analog domain. But there's also dynamic range in the digital domain. And that is extremely well defined most of the time. For example, a 16-bit PCM WAV file has a dynamic range, a theoretical dynamic range, of 96 decibels. How do we know that? Well, there are 16 bits. If we have a 1-bit audio stream, that means it's either on or off. So the highest fidelity we can really encode is a train of pulse waves, and they are all at the same loudness, maximum loudness. If we have two bits of information, we can have either complete silence, a square wave at one-third loudness, a square wave at two-third loudness, or a full loudness square wave. But then if we try to jiggle the samples, we can create something that will sound more or less like a triangle wave if we have like one, two, three, two, one, zero, etc. It may sound like a si like a triangle wave. Again, that's extremely low fidelity audio still. The least has probably been used in like consumer applications was 8-bit, I believe at least in computer age. 8-bit samples were common for mod music, trackers and stuff. And even, I bl I, I'm pretty sure that even the first Half-Life has 8-bit resolution of its sound files, of its uh, sound effects. They sound extremely crusty, and it's a big shame because the sound design is interesting. Here is an example of an 8-bit sound recording. Notice how the background noise is all distorted and crackly. Now the bit depth is totally unrelated to sample rate. Before you've heard 8-bit PCM sound. However, it was still at 44.1 or 48 kilohertz sampling rate. Now you are listening to 8-bit PCM at 16 kilohertz sampling rate. That's quite a difference, isn't it? If that sounds nostalgic, you're probably over 30. Okay, but 
how do these bits actually define the dynamic range? Well, adding a single bit to our dynamic range or bit depth of an audio signal, digital audio signal, is giving us extra six decibels. So if we have eight bits, when we take eight and multiply by six, that's going to be the dynamic range, the theoretical maximum dynamic range that we can represent in this 8-bit digital audio stream. Similarly with 16 bits, we just multiply 16 by 6. Okay, now this is all dynamic range of the medium, which doesn't mean the information you put on the medium is going to utilize all that. For example, your 16-bit audio CD could be produced so quiet that it will effectively only have like 30 decibels of dynamic range because you'll have to play it so loud that you, were, you will hear the noise floor of the medium. Noise floor. That's also a very important concept in dynamic range. In photography or, or film, Noise floor is the grain of the film itself. So if you have amounts of light that are so tiny that the grain of the film is hiding them, well, that means the amount of signal or light is lower than the smallest amount of light that can be registered cleanly. And if for some reason there is more noise, our practical dynamic range gets smaller because quieter sounds, darker lights, all get drowned in the noise. And that leads us to dynamic range of music. There's a well-known concept at this point of loudness war, which in summary is a trend of producing the digital releases of music recordings, which, are, which have less and less dynamic range and are pushing the limits of digital audio, which is pretty much pointless, but the record company started doing it, I think, because they believed it boosts sales. It didn't. It never does. People don't care because every playback system on the planet has a volume control. And unless you are making your music so quiet that it's practically very difficult to play at a comfortable level, it is really irrelevant how loud you make your music. There's some very helpful technology, especially developed in the past decades. And the best standard for measuring loudness in a digital format is the EBU, which is European Broadcast Union, R128, which is the recommendation 128, that defines the loudness units and loudness units full-scale measurements, as well as a few methods of calculating different types of measurements, like the integrated measurement that averages the level across an entire program. Now, European Broadcast Union mainly deals with television. That's why there's the term program. But we can also apply this to a musical piece, a track, or an entire album, or a DJ mix. Whatever has a start and an end, if you measure and average the loudness units or loudness units full scale across the entire <laughs> length, that's your integrated loudness level. There have been older methods of measuring loudness. The first, I believe, was VU meters. 
which were physical needles bouncing back and forth. These meters were pretty cool because they averaged the signal. So you they wouldn't react very much to peaks because we as people don't react very much to peaks as well. If there's a short pop, we don't register it as loud as a continuous tone that would be of the same peak loudness. That's why short transients don't bother us that much, well, unless they cross the threshold of pain, of course. This is why it's so ironic that the loudness wars, or the loudness war, have driven music to be completely devoid of any drum transients whatsoever, because the recording is so compressed and limited beyond belief that when you look at the waveform, you really can't tell where a kick hits or a snare hits. You, you can't tell where's a verse, where is a chorus, where's a drop and where's a buildup almost. And it really hurts the musical expression, and it really hurts the clarity of the sound. And yes, you can be a producer that prouds themselves on being able to push the numbers extremely high with your music still sounding acceptable. Let, let's put that in air quotes, because what is acceptable to one person may not be acceptable to another person. But what is really the point of being, like, chasing that goal? Does it make the music better? It does not. It makes it worse. You may say that, oh, but if the music has less dynamic range, it's going to be easier to mix for a DJ and to play back on a loud PA system. That is false. <laughs> Squashed music destroys PA systems. It doesn't sound good. It doesn't play better. The sound systems are designed to handle short transients, so short bursts of loud sounds very well, and they can do it very cleanly. So if your music has a loud snare and kick transient, you can easily have, you know, like 15 decibels of headroom and... The music can be loud and the transients can be much louder and still your music will be clean on the PA system. Of course, 15 decibels is quite excessive. I would not probably want to have as much dynamic range between like the peak of my bass and the peak of my drums. Or, uh, that would probably not sound very balanced. However, I do like to have natural sounding transients or natural that doesn't necessarily have to be natural it's not about naturalism it's about expression and making the sound move you <laughs> because when you remove all the transients the power of music is diminished in my opinion music requires dynamics that is changes in intensity if our music would be exactly the same loudness throughout the whole piece, it would be boring as heck. The most exciting music is the one that can vary the levels and inspire emotion thanks to that. Editing the
human experience, human life is not steady. It's anything but. And the music reflects that. And music is always swelling up and down. We have quieter sections and louder sections. And the louder sections only hit hard if the quieter sections are there to lay a bass line. If we have no bass line because we are loud 110% all the freaking time, there is no music left. And, you know, I'm not like some classical music junkie who doesn't listen to bass music and doesn't understand what rock, metal, and drum and bass is. No. I really like hard-hitting sounds and hard-hitting music, but it pains me that when I listen to Noisiest Outer Edges album on YouTube, there is like eight decibels of dynamic range that they could have had, but they didn't. YouTube is using loudness normalization, which means that the integrated level of your video or whatever you're uploading as a video, could be your music track, could be your album, the integrated level is measured and compared to a reference level. On YouTube, the reference level is around negative 14 LUFS. And that is our level that I'm roughly targeting whatever I master music or music videos, music releases. Talking head videos necessarily should be quieter because... Speech alone does not sound well when put to such high levels, in my opinion. And also when I'm doing tutorials about music production, there has to be more dynamic range because there's a lot of silence in between sounds. And also you need to be able to hear precisely what's going on. And smashing the whole video with a limiter would only make that harder. I don't need to push the limits because the video is going to be too quiet, there is a large margin before it becomes too quiet to listen to comfortably. There are some videos on YouTube that are made too quiet, and I can't hear them, but it's not because of the concerns of dynamic range. It's because they were poorly engineered, and the person making them either didn't know, or forgot, or didn't pay attention to the loudness of their sound. So sometimes listening to some videos on headphones while on the go is difficult. And it can be difficult for music as well, but I'm not talking about making your music so dynamic it's unlistenable outside of a quiet listening space with perfect speaker system. <laughs> I'm asking for a bare minimum of air in your freaking masters. <laughs> If you've ever cared to measure any of my music releases, you'll see that they average around negative 14, negative 12 LUFS integrated. And I think that's, that's a good level. It has quite a lot of dynamic range for drums to hit hard and sound punchy without relying sol solely on distortion and without having to completely drown out all other audio in your mix to achieve the punchiness, which will still be puny and miserable compared to an actual freaking transient. I would understand this if we were if we were stuck with like, you know, 10-bit digital audio where you actually have to make sure you make the best out of every single bit of dynamic range. But we freaking don't! We have 16 bits, 96 decibels. That's a lot of dynamic range. And ironically, with the higher fidelity of compact disc, which undisputedly beats vinyl records if it comes to dynamic range and frequency reproduction and distortion. The compact disc is a fantastic medium and it was an, a huge leap in audio quality in consumer audio quality it doesn't mean a tape machine can't sound as good it sure can but it's freaking expensive and it can deteriorate easily the tapes can de deteriorate more easily it's harder to store them etc 
And with the advent of the best music storage medium in history, the music quality started diminishing because people were like <laughs> doing everything they can to waste as much dynamic range as possible and to squash their music to completely unlistenable degree. It hurts me so much when I listen to System of a Down's Toxicity that this album is so f limited. There is so little transience there. <laughs> it's squashed. The drums, the drums can't breathe and they are so quiet in comparison to everything else. And they could maintain a similar level but still hit much harder and have more punch and air if they have had, like, you know, just six decibels of more dynamic range. But no. They had to squash it. Because sales. Which didn't affect sales anyway. If anything, I think people who are aware of the problems with excessive limiting and multiband compressing your masters would buy less albums which are highly processed in this manner. Again, I'm not talking about sound design. Smash things in sound design as much as you want. I love distortion and multiband compression and removing every single bit of air from your synth sounds, your basses and your drums. But then, when you do it on your master bus, you're killing your music. <laughs> and also, after I squash my drums like that, then I mix it back with the original or I use compression to bring back some transients so they can hit harder. You can have all the good things about squashed, highly compressed sound without any of the bad things if you just use compression, parallel compression, and transient shapers effectively. You don't have to just mindlessly slam your music with a limiter. Don't. Can this catch focus? I think it can. Or can it? All right, I've been talking for way too long right now. Thanks for watching. I thought I'm going to record something on this little bike trip. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, thanks to everyone who is supporting me on Patreon and LiberaPay. These people are helping me immensely making more videos. And stay tuned for more actual open source music and audio production tutorials. Oh, and if you would like some help, with Linux and open source music production, you can always check out my chat at chat.anfa.xyz. All right, I should get going. It's become pretty dark. Bye.